there everyone. Today's video lecture is on one of the most notorious social psychology studies ever considered, the Stanford Prison Experiment conducted by Dr. Philip Zimbardo. Now, Philip Zimbardo was from an Italian American family and he was born in New York in 1933. His family were very impoverished and he suffered quite a lot of discrimination as a result of being part of that family. People knew that he was poor, so discriminated him as a result of being poor. They also often thought that he was an ethnic minority or they thought he was Jewish, which at the time Jewish people were suffering from a lot of discrimination. Um, as you can see, it was around the time um, that um, anti-Semitic tensions were on the rise. So he suffered quite a lot of discrimination at a young age. Now, because of this, he developed an interest into why people discriminate and why people act um, towards other people the way that they do. He wanted to understand how people adopt the roles of being the persecuted and the persecutor. So he went on to study psychology. He triple majored and graduated from Brooklyn College and then went on to do a PhD at Yale. He then studied and um, researched and taught in social psychology at Yale, Columbia and finally at Stanford. So we can see that he's a very um, well known, a very um, important person in social psychology right from the outset. Um, it was at Stanford that he conducted his now infamous study, the Stanford Prison Experiment. As mentioned on the previous slide, Zimbardo wanted to study the roles that people play in different situations and how people adopt the role of persecutor and persecuted. The way he did this in the Stanford Prison Experiment was to study the roles that people play in prison situations. So he converted a basement in Stanford University um, into a mock prison. So um, this prison had, um, obviously it had the cells, it had staff rooms for the prison guards, and it had offices for the um, warden and other members of prison staff. Now, these weren't actually prison staff, but in fact, they were students. So he advertised asking for volunteers, so students at Stanford University, to participate in a study of the psychological effects of prison life. So here we can see he deceived them slightly, um, as the study wasn't really into the psychological effects of prison life, but about social roles. When people volunteered to take part, he screened these respondents for psychological problems and history of crime. So 75 people applied to take part in this study and he screened these 75 people. Finally, he was left with 24 men who he had judged to be the most physically and mentally stable, the most mature and least involved in antisocial behaviours. Now this is really important because he took 75 people and identified those who are least likely to be of any danger those who he considered to be least likely to be vulnerable to abusing prisoners or even to be um, an abusive prisoner. So these 24 men were chosen to participate and they were paid £15, well $15, sorry, per day to take part in the experiment. So what happened next? Participants were randomly assigned to either the role of the prisoner or the prison guard. Now, once these roles had been allocated, the participants who were allocated as being the prisoners were immediately treated like any other prisoner. That means that they were actually arrested at their own homes without warning. Some of these were videoed and you can see these on YouTube. Um, so you can see that they're very shocked. They're arrested in front of their family, in front of their neighbors. At no point do the people who are arresting them, who are actually from the police department, actually say that they weren't in trouble, that this was just part of the experiment. They were treated exactly as though they had done something wrong. So they were arrested in their own homes without warning and taken to the local police station. Following this, they were blindfolded and driven to the psychology department at Stanford University. Here, they were taken into the basement. So they didn't actually really know where they were, 
all they saw was that they had arrived at the basement, well, at the, um, at the prison. This is where the de-individuation process began. Now, if you remember from lecture, um, the de-individuation process is where you adopt um, a role that is less, that isn't as individual as your own. Now, I've not explained that very well. What I mean is um, the de-individuation de process removes your individuality. So this might be from wearing a face mask so that you can't see your face, um, wearing a white lab coat to cover up your clothes, other ways that identify as an individual. So the way that they um, de-individuated the participants in this study was that the prisoners were stripped of their own clothes and their own personal possessions and instead were issued with a prison uniform. Following this, they were only referred to by the number in their prison uniform only. So this dehumanised them as well as de-individuating them. Also, the guards, so the participants who were um, allocated to being prison guards, were also given a uniform. Now, their uniform also de-individuated them. As we can see on the previous slides, um, they were given large sunglasses and um, quite nondescript prison guard uniforms. So this covered their face and took away the individuality of their own clothes to help them adopt this role of prison guard and, as we can see here, of prisoner. However, within a very short period of time, both guards and prisoners started to settle into their new roles. The findings of the study are quite dramatic, and I really can't go into the very, very in-depth findings of the study because of this only being a very short uh, seminar video, uh, but I'll summarise the key findings. So the guards and prisoners adopted the role of being a guard or a prisoner very quickly. The guards began to misuse their power, mentally and physically harassing the prisoners. So they did this by stripping them naked, depriving them of food, putting them in isolation, turning them against each other, they starved them, they put them in social isolation for longer than the hour um, that was the absolute maximum period of time, they put prisoners who misbehaved into isolation for much longer. Ultimately, they became uh, quite violent and abusive. Now, this happened very, very quickly. Prisoners started, um, sorry, prison guards started to abuse prisoners within the first day. Prisoners also adopted the role of being a prisoner. Even though as a prisoner, you might have more individuality um, compared to being a guard because you don't necessarily have your specific way of behaving, um, the prisoners adopted this helpless attitude. Because they were being abused by the prison guards, um, they felt helpless, they couldn't do anything, and they started to adopt this mindset of being a prisoner. Some even started to forget that this was a study and felt that they were being bad prisoners and questioned the nature of the study and wondered if they would ever get out. Such was the intensity of this role that they had adopted of the, help, the hopeless and helpless prisoner. Because of this abuse and because of this sort of mental torture, prisoners experienced severe psychological reactions even within 36 hours of being in the prison. Now, this included delirium, panic, uncontrollable sobbing, and even psychosomatic rashes. So these participants developed stress-related rashes as a result of the intense psychological pressure they were experiencing. Now, this research was supposed to be carried out over two weeks. However, the study was ended after only six days due to the extreme reactions of the participants, and it was deemed that it would be um, unfair and unethical to continue with the experiment. So, what were the conclusions? Well, according to Zimbardo and his colleagues, the Stanford Prison Experiment revealed that individuals are vulnerable to conforming to stereotype roles. If you remember, these participants were identified as being really similar at the outset. They were all mentally healthy, they were all physically healthy, and all of them were considered to be at no um, vulnerability of becoming violent and antisocial. But they conformed to these roles of being uh, the helpless prisoner or the abusive prison guard very, very early on in the study. 
So basically, if these really healthy, mentally and physically healthy individuals can conform to stereotype roles that quickly, then that shows that people who have other vulnerabilities, whose individual differences are not quite as strong against these pressures, will probably also conform as well. Because the guards were placed in a position of authority, they acted as they thought the situation demanded, to be authoritative and to be um, abusive to the prisoners. The prison environment was an important factor in creating the guards' brutal behaviour. None of the participants who had acted as guards had showed any sadistic tendencies before the study, and so it was their understanding of the situation and what they felt the situation demanded that moulded their behaviour. So this actually has some really interesting applications for abuse in other settings. It's very difficult to filter out who might be abusive in these situations if even the mentally strongest people can become um, bad apples if they're kept in a bad barrel. And that's what Philip Zimbardo said. Basically, you could have a barrel full of good apples, as these students were, but if you put them in a bad barrel, a situation that people are associate with, um, with abuse and um, authority, they might become bad apples. So basically, Zimbardo was saying that it's a situation that makes someone behave in a certain way, rather than their dispositional or internal attributes. And this was seen in Abu Ghraib. So during the early stages of the Iraq war, the US military personnel conducted a series of human rights violations against detainees in the Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq. Now this included physical and sexual abuse, torture, rape, sodomy and murder. There were thousands of images recorded by these soldiers of the abusive acts that they were conducting. And they seemed even proud of what they were doing, standing beside dead bodies, posing with their thumbs up, acting as though they were doing something to be proud of, when actually they were torturing vulnerable people. Zimbardo highlighted the similarities between the behaviour the behavior of the participants in the Stanford prison experiment and the prisoner abuse at Abu Ghraib. These people were theoretically the cream of the crop. These are American citizens who are military personnel who should theoretically be people who are um, keeping law and order, who are in a position of power. However, as we can see, they committed horrible atrocities. The, um, so Zimbardo rejected the claim of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of, Chief of Staff, uh, General Myers, that the events were due to just a few rogue soldiers and that it did not reflect the military, because that wasn't what happened in the Stanford Prison Experiment. The students in the Stanford Prison Experiment had all been screened and had come out on top as being the best candidates for the role. Um, and it was actually the situation, he thought, that made those students turn into abusive prison guards. So it stands to reason that in this situation, um, individuals in the military um, were made to be rogue by the situation and not because they were just a few rogue soldiers. Instead, he looked at the situation the soldiers were in and considered the possibility that this situation might have induced the behaviour that they displayed. Now, this is really important because if one person or a few rogue people are um, to blame for their actions, of course, they, have, um, they do have some level of blame. I'm not saying they're blameless at all. But if it's just a few rogue people, then you punish those people, you remove those people from the situation, it's problem solved. But if it's the situation that's causing these things to happen, then you need to stop that situation. And so this kind of research, this kind of explanation has applications for how prisons are run and the kinds of um, responsibility um, that these individuals have. So much for watching this video seminar. Um, as I mentioned when I was discussing the findings, um, 
there's nowhere near enough time to discuss the whole of the Stanford Prison Experiment in just a short video seminar. So please do take some time to have a look into um, some of the other information out there about the Stanford Prison Studies, uh, about the Stanford Prison Study. I've actually included a TED Talk um, on Moodle. Um, so if you go there and click on the TED Talk, you can see um, a video by Zimbardo himself talking about the Stanford Prison Study and its applications to Abu Ghraib. Um, that's a very interesting TED Talk. It's about 20 minutes long. Again, he doesn't manage to go into all of the detail, but that is really from um, Zimbardo, the horse's mouth, as it were, um, about his study. Um, any questions, please feel free to post on the forum or ask me in class. Thanks, guys.